there was so much passion in the story, and it was so shocking to me, you know, your story, that I, it was like, it, it pulled a lot of passion out of me. And so I, I saved that clip, because it's like, you know, they want to see your emotions and everything as an anchor. Mm -hmm. But I remember it, it just really struck me at the time, too. So oh, wow. <laughs> I saved that. It's always going to be on my reel, whether I stay here or not. But if I ever send that to somebody, it's just reading it, I'm like, you know, it was basically like my enthusiasm was like, guys, listen, this is what happened, and yeah. here's where we're at right now. Well, I appreciate it. And that was before, obviously, the governor made the announcement. And, yeah. Uh, are we good? We're good to go? <coughs> okay. Uh, well, first of all, Centoya, we're so glad to have you here. Thank you. Free. Yes. Here at the New Sports <laughs> Studios. It's incredible. It is. It is. It's literally a miracle. I mean, everything has changed so much for you. Uh, you know, you go from being incarcerated to being here, doing interviews. You're going to be doing, doing a media tour in New York. You have your, your book. It's just been released, mm -hmm. and that tells the whole story. How has this been for you, this whole process, this whirlwind of emotions you've experienced since getting out? Um, it's just been incredible. You know, God is good, and it's just, it really, really makes you see that it is true. You know, Jesus can give you new life, and he truly set me free, and every day I'm just so thankful. You know, the littlest things just bring me so much joy that I'm able to do it. So it's it's really incredible. If we could, and we'll go back into um, the days behind bars too a little more, but what is it that you draw? That I think a lot of people would imagine that you feel a lot of animosity mm -hmm. or feel like you were sort of done wrong for spending that much time behind bars. Um, and finally having the appeal heard and the clemency granted, but there doesn't seem to be any bitterness in you. No, I don't feel any animosity. I don't feel any anger or anything like that. I just can't help but feel an overwhelming, you know, gratitude and just a sense of awe with how everything played out. Um, just being able to see the way God worked through everything. And I really think that, you know, he has purposes for everything. So I can see the purpose in everything that's happened. I can see that you know, there's a calling that's come from this. And so it's really just a blessing. I just feel blessed. Your faith has been a big part of this journey, and mm -hmm. you wrote about it in your book quite a bit. When did you sort of give your life to Christ, and when did God become a major factor in your life? So I actually grew up in the church. Um, my mother kept me in the Baptist church coming up, and I believed in Jesus. I had always believed in him. But there was a time when things were happening with my conviction, with me getting sentenced. And it's like, as time went on, and it was like, how can God be real if he's not hearing me, he's not helping me? And every time I believe that he's going to step in, like it doesn't happen. And so there's a whole process, like you said, I talk about it in the book, whereby I came to see that he was working things out the whole time. And so just actually piecing that together, and it's like, wow. Like, even when I doubted him, he was still working in my favor. He was still working things out for me. And he's done things in a way that not only am I free, but other people may gain their freedom through this as well. So. When you were behind bars, I think when the announcement came out that you were married, mm -hmm. how did that come to be? Um, I'm not sure. Um, you news people, like, you can't really hide much from you. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know how it came to be. Um, that you all found out I was married, but very much, very much happy. Um, it's just, again, I talked about it in the book, the way things happen from the way that I met my husband, um, the fact that I even had a correspondence with him, had that conversation with him, our whole journey is just all tied up in God's plan. And just, it was just an incredible journey and I'm just so blessed to have him. He's a good man. Incredible seems like a good word for that. To yes. Find love in those circumstances. Yeah. Love in those circumstances is completely different than what I thought love was. You know, when I was younger, of course, the man that I thought I loved, it wasn't love. And that wasn't a boyfriend. He was actually a trafficker. And so it was a whole process of me understanding what it meant to have healthy relationships with people, what it meant to really love another person, to love myself. And so 
with my husband, it's like, wow, like the way he loves me is when I think of the way God loves us all. It's like I can see that. Um, and so it's just, it's unlike any other, any other thing that I've ever experienced with someone. Can you talk about your childhood a little bit? I, mean, I think, you know, right in the middle of these types of books, there's pictures. Mm. Some of the first pictures I see right here are some toys, just a little baby girl. Yeah. You know, of course, we know you as you are now. Mm -hmm. You've been in the media. You know, everyone out in the public has seen you as you are today. Mm -hmm. But we look at these, and, and it makes us think, how did all this happen, this little yeah. girl, to arrive at this point? Can you talk about your childhood and sort of growing up? Yeah, you know, I'm asked that a lot, and I think that's a logical question. When you see situations like this, you automatically think, how did this happen? Like, and it's not important for us, you know, just to understand, but it's important for us to try to prevent it from happening to someone else. And so I really wanted to go into depth with that in my book, and I did. You know, I outlined everything that contributed to me being in that place where I was when I was 16. So I talk in the book about my childhood, how, you know, it seemed that everything was normal. I had a healthy environment around me, um, but you'll see that there were some things that were just going on inside of me that kind of just defeated all of that. Every attempt um, to try to help me and to try to make sure that I had a healthy, healthy childhood was just, it was just overcome by those inner demons. For people who will be watching this, and maybe who won't get the chance to read your book. I hope everybody reads the book. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, too. Like, I think there's a lot that people can get from this. But if we're talking about young ladies or mm -hmm. parents that are watching and they have a daughter, mm -hmm. is there something that you can tell them? Is there, can this happen to anyone? And, and what are some things that we as parents need to watch out for? Mm -hmm. Or teenagers, yeah. young women should watch out for? What, what's some piece of information that you can give us to really be mindful of. Yeah, it, it can absolutely happen to anyone. I think that we really need to be mindful of the different influences um, that affect children, that affect young people. You know, our minds are so impressionable when we're young. And what our parents teach us, that's one thing, but we're learning from school, we're learning from our peers. Now we're learning so much with social media. You know, there's so many things that are glorified now that aren't necessarily conducive to a healthy understanding of relationships, of self-worth, um, of so many things that parents may try to instill in their kids, but it's being overcome by all these other messages. Um, so I think it's very important that we have those conversations about what's out there and why that may not necessarily be the best um, for us to take in because what I can remember is I took on a lot of things around me as truth and they weren't necessarily the truth. They weren't what my mother was teaching me. They weren't leading me in a positive direction. And so I think it's, it's very important that we address that because those are big factors. I think people hearing your story might be inclined to shelter their daughter, to mm -hmm. protect her, um, something like that. If, if you were to have a daughter one day, what maybe maybe this is a difficult question or maybe it will cause you to, to think a little bit or maybe you need a mm -hmm. moment, but if you have a daughter one day, what are some things that you will try to teach her so something like this wouldn't happen to her? Well, number one, I'm going to let her know, you know, the real that's out there. I'm definitely not going to try to shelter her um, from anything. Um, but me personally, the most important thing that I can teach my daughter is about Jesus. Um, so that, having that solid foundation from which to operate in the world, seeing things through the lens of Christ, I think that that's, that's really important for me personally. I know you get into your, to this in your book right here, but you know, you, know, you spent all these years behind bars, incarcerated, feeling like something's been done wrong, this is, was a mistake, and people weren't listening, and people didn't hear the story, and then finally people did start listening. What were those years like when you're serving time thinking you're going to be in here for decades, when you knew what actually happened and people just weren't listening? How did that feel? There must have been just a complete darkness. Yeah, um, there were definitely dark moments um, during my car incarceration, moments where I was like, 
I can't really face the prospect of this actually happening, me dying in prison. But, you know, you really have no choice but to continue hoping. And so there's that cycle where you're hoping and then, yeah, your hopes are dashed, but you just keep hanging on. And you just have to learn to just reach past that breaking point. And that was a big, big part of me being able to hold on and make it through because it is difficult. You know, it's hard. It's a very, very hard situation for anyone to be in. There's many people still going through that situation now. Um, and so it's very difficult. And you just got to continue to have faith that someday things are going to change. And being resilient, too. You, you mm -hmm. never gave up. You kept trying to get your story out there to tell people the truth. Mm -hmm. And people started listening. What was it that caused people to finally hear? Well, for me... Telling my story, you know, sharing my testimony now, it was less about, you know, trying to convince and listen, listen, but it was more for me to issue a warning to other young girls, to other young people. When I first came into the system, I didn't think that this could happen. Like when I was 15 and 14, you could have never told me that I could be spending the rest of my life in prison at the age of 16. I would have never believed that. I would have never believed that I would end up in the situations that I was in. So for me, it was important to tell other young people, you know, this can happen. Like, please listen to me. If you don't listen to anyone else, you think your teachers don't understand, you think your parents don't understand, take it from someone who's been down this road, someone who does understand, and look to see where this led me, and look in your own lives and think, okay, am I headed in this direction too? I think people can imagine the circumstances you were in or think that they can imagine it. But um, can you take us back to when you were 16, those fateful moments when that happened? Yeah. And you, how were you feeling? What was going on in your life, in your mind, in your emotions? Yeah, so one of the things, you know, that's been important for me through this whole journey, one of the things that really opened things up is when we looked beyond that moment that particular moment and kind of just looked at everything that contributed to it, everything that led up to it, everything that played a factor in it. And there was so much that was going on at the time, so many things that I had been learning from the people that were around me that led me to be in that situation with this man in the first place, that led me to being vulnerable, to being exploited by him. And it took years for me to unpack that, you know, because in those moments, in that very moment, that the actual incident happened, it's like all of these pieces just kind of shattered. And so for years it was me picking up the pieces, really examining it, really thinking, what happened? Like, how did this all come together? And so it was just, just an explosive situation all around and so many things played a factor in it. You know, I hope that by reading the book you can tell just how they played a factor, how, you know, it was what was under that iceberg, the tip of that iceberg that really contributed to what happened that night. So let's talk about the good news. Yeah. When you found out about the decision to grant you clemency, what was that like? Where were you? How did you receive the news? So, um, again, I go into specifics in my book. Um, incredible, incredible, incredible story about everything that led up to that, everything that led up to that moment, the great buildup. Um, but when the moment actually came, um, I know my attorney had already told, you know, the news about how he walked in and he told me, you're getting out. And I was like, okay, great. You know, because it was like, I already knew, like, that God had told me that it was coming. So it was more like a, you know, thank God, like, here it is. So it was, it was very, very, very relieved um, that I was feeling, I was just so grateful and just feeling so gracious in that moment. So, but it wasn't immediate, so you know, I had to think, all right, now, all these things that I've dreamed, all these things that I've planned and I look forward to, now I need to think practically, like how, how am I gonna get from point A to point B? Um, and so that's when I started writing the book, um, started working on that, started working on making sure that everything with me was prepared to transition from being in prison to being in the free world. In many ways, you became a household name through this journey. I mean, you've got Rihanna, K. 
Kim Kardashian West. You became a, a social media hashtag. Mm -hmm. What do you make of all the attention that this has garnered? Yeah, um, personally, I just make of it that no one is beyond the reach of God. Like, God can touch anybody's heart. Um, so I think it's incredible that you had homemakers, you had doctors, you had lawyers, you had teachers, you had people overseas, you had people in many different stations in life, many different platforms who were just so moved. And it was just incredible. And, you know, it gives me hope that for the people that are still in these situations, like there's an entire community of people who are just waiting to wrap their arms around them, who are willing to advocate for them as well. Um, so I definitely hope that continues. Um, that is my prayer, you know, because there are several people who are in the same situation that I was in that are still in that situation. I think that's the most beautiful thing about it is I think a lot of people realized when you got out it wasn't just going to be like, okay, bye-bye, thank you. Yeah. You have a mission now. Absolutely. Talk about that a little bit. Your yeah. plan, your mission, what do the next five years look like for you? Um, so I can't say what the next five years looks like. I don't know that. Only God knows. You know, we plan, he laughs. Um, but definitely just, I feel this immense calling from God to use his testimony, to use everything that I've experienced in a way that not only glorifies him, but is for the good of his kingdom, you know. And so sharing my story in a way that can shed light on some of the things that people may not be aware of. Um, people aren't really aware of what it means to be trafficked. There's still a lot of people who think that there is such a thing as teenage prostitutes, and that's just not true. Um, so actually putting a face to that, actually showing how that can happen and the realities of what it means to be a trafficking victim, that's something um, that I'm committed to. Actually showing that there are people in prison that are people you know, it's not just this one worst moment in their life that were way more complex than that. Actually putting a face to those individuals, I mean, I'm committed to that. Um, so anywhere that I feel that my experiences, um, that my testimony can be of, of some help to some other person, then I'm absolutely committed to doing that, however it looks, over the next five years. I have a copy of your book right here, Free Centoya, mm -hmm. appropriately named. How did it feel? to put the story of your life into this book? It was, it was work. <laughs> so I remember thinking like, you know, when it comes to writing this book, like, oh, it'll come, like I lived it, I know the story, but it was so much work to actually sit down and write it. Um, it took me years to actually like get to the point where I was ready. And then um, in a church service, one of the volunteers had told me, you know, God said, write the book. And I said, okay been trying you know for all these years but I'll write the book you know and so I sat down and all of a sudden it just started flowing and so within the space of six months I had finished the manuscript um, started working with a writer by the name of Bethany Mogger incredible woman um, incredible writer and of course that was a struggle having to write through the prison phone and it was just a lot so when it was finally done it was just such such a great feeling, you know. Um, I think that I'll finally feel accomplished when I can see, like, what it's going to do. Like, you know, what are people thinking? Do they take from it? Like, is it is it hitting home? Um, so then I'll feel like, okay, I've done something. Let's talk about it. So you had to communicate with the writer through the prison phone. Yes. What was that like? Oh, it's rough. It's rough. Um, Anybody who has ever had to deal with global telling knows that anytime you have to use the phone in prison, it's a struggle. Um, number one, they charge you an arm and a leg. Uh, oh, yeah, to make any phone calls. So it was very expensive. You know, having to call, it was like $3 per phone call. And you have to think when you're writing a book, that's several hours that you're having to talk with this person. And you have to make sure that you have a phone available. There's only four phones and on any given day one or two are, are the only ones that work and you have like a hundred other women trying to use those same phones so you have to work out a schedule of how you can get to a phone and how you can call back you have to wait in line again it's just it's a lot it's a hassle so but she was very patient um, and we got it done 
Got it done. Mm -hmm. Here we have a copy in our hand. Yep. Signed. Who should read this book? Everyone. Everyone should read the book. And I'm not saying that because I'm biased. <laughs> I'm really, there's something for everyone in the book. You know, it touches on, like you said, every parent um, who wants to look for the different things to be on the lookout for when it comes to raising a child. Um, teachers. You know, anybody in the education field, anybody in the counseling field, some of those feelings that I was feeling, some of the influences and the way they affected me, I talk about that. I talk about the factors that lead up to trafficking. I talk about, you know, how it actually came about. It's not just somebody snatching you off a bus stop all the time, you know. Um, I talk about the justice system, talk about the juvenile justice system. I talk about, you know, my transformation, like through Jesus. like. When I tell you there's no stone left unturned in this book, so there's literally something for everyone in this book, and that's what I'm most proud of when it comes to this, that we were able to condense it all. Like, there was so much to tell, and we did it um, in 333 pages. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so something for book. everyone. Now the media tour. You're going to New York next week. What's next for you? Again, whatever God calls me to do, you know. So I know that um, my heart is definitely in speaking about my experiences. It's in sharing my experiences with other young people, doing whatever I can to contribute um, to helping them, to helping people who work with young people, to helping people who work in the justice system, to help people who are still trapped in the justice system. So however that comes across, however God wants to use me, I'm willing. Anything else you want Nashville to know, Middle Tennessee to know about Centoya now? Well, um, I want them to know that I'm grateful. I'm so thankful um, for all the people who came together to speak up, um, all the people who prayed for me, people who didn't even know me, had never even, you know, heard of me outside of what they, they heard, but they were so moved to, to sign petitions, to write letters, to call the governor. The poor governor's office had to replace his whole phone system <laughs> from all the phone calls. So just just thank you. Um, I'm so grateful. And like I said, there's so many other people who are still in the same situations. So I just encourage you to just continue researching, continue educating yourself about you know these issues and continue to be an advocate. And read the book. And read the book. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank so you. lovely to have you in here, so yeah. thank you. Go ahead and uh, just keep talking. Keep talking. You want a couple shots. two shots? Okay. Okay. I mean, so we're talking about, a, I guess, do you have a relationship still with Rihanna and Kim Kardashian? I think people always want to know. No. That. So I've never spoken with either of them. <laughs> so I've never had any kind of relationship or anything. You know, I appreciate, you know, how they use their platform to speak up for issues on justice and things of that nature, but... Um. I think a lot of people assume that you guys became friends and this sort of thing, but this was all a big social media push that was sort of done without you really, really even being in contact with them. Is that right? Yeah. Is there something you guys want to add? What do I have? It's good. It's not like okay. good. Okay. You can pop on in there. He checks my hair and my clothes and makeup That's for good. me. <laughs> it's important. So, it is freezing in I here. Know. Sorry. So, I like your shoes, by the way. Thank you. I was going to tell you that. I got to stand up all month long, <laughs> so we're going to make sure we're comfortable. Yeah. So Tuesday it's the Today Show, and that's live. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be on set with Savannah and Hoda. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then from from there, do you know where? You're I be? honestly, I don't know. There is so much. Like I looked, and then I was like, I'll worry about that later. And you have speaking engagements, I'm assuming, planned and everything. You're gonna... Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be busy. A long month. Cool. Anything else you guys feel is important to touch on? I, I, I mean, I think you covered it really well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's great. Thank you so much. You guys good? You need anything else? Thank you. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think of when you see those pictures of you and in the book here? This is your book of your life. And those are pictures of you when you're little. How does that feel? Um, It's crazy, <laughs> you know? It's crazy. It's amazing what God can do, you know. I know some of these pictures. I wish I had better ones. When you look at like my mug shots, for instance. <laughs> when you look at some of the pictures on the first page, mm -hmm. Young Centoya, um, 
What would you tell that little girl? Um, I just let her know, you know, how loved she was. And um, to never feel like she has to change who she is because she doesn't feel like she belongs where she is. Um, because she's loved, God loves her, Jesus loved her just the way she is. Hmm. So. And what about, as you page forward a couple more, there's the signs, there's people freezing toy on holding those signs. And yeah. That, <laughs> that must be incredible. Oh, right? yeah. A wave across the nation, mm -hmm. fueled, yes, by Rihanna and some big names, but, I mean, what is that like? Just, you know, here's a... Here's some white guy, and wherever the heck he is, holding a sign. And no, that's a black well, woman. A black, well, <laughs> everybody was behind this. I mean, like you said, you had yeah. doctors, mothers, you know, stay-at-home moms who were, who were jumping in, mm -hmm. and they wanted to make sure that you got free. Yeah. What is it like when, when you see those pictures and when you hear about that? And There's probably a lot of things, I'm sure, that happened that you haven't seen, all the support. Like I said, I just, I just see God in it all. I just see Jesus. You know, like, it's amazing, like, what he can do. Like, we always look in the Bible and we think, okay, yeah, that happened. And, you know, that was then. And this is, like, a historical book. No, it's a living book. Like, it's still happening. Like, that's his word. Like, he still does it. And, like, I, that's what I see when I see this picture. Like, how else would someone who's never met me, who doesn't know me, look how passionate she is. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. There's your husband. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll read about that in the book, I guess. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <All> <laughs> you, right. you guys good? Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. You guys good? You need anything else? Jason, you shooting a little uh, bit? Yeah, a couple more minutes. Just we can oh, okay. my bad. I'm oh, sorry. Maybe a couple more. So make sure. Just some cutaways. Maybe we could have you hold the book a little okay. bit and kind of talk about it. Maybe page through some pictures or something. I don't know if you have any stories that are conjured up by some of the pictures or anything. This is sort of just... Mm -hmm. For video, mm -hmm. what do you think of when you see those pictures of you in a book here? This is your book of your life, and those are pictures of you when you're little. How does that feel? Um, it's crazy, <laughs> you know. It's crazy. It's amazing what God can do, you know. I know some of these pictures. I wish I had better ones. When you look at like mug shots, for instance. The mug. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at some of the pictures on the first page. Mm -hmm. Young Centoya, um, what would you tell that little girl? Um, I just let her know, you know, how loved she was. And um, to never feel like she has to change who she is because she doesn't feel like she belongs where she is. Um, because she's loved, God loves her, Jesus loved her just the way she is. Hmm. So.